Uh, hi, all. Uh, thanks so much for having me here at ThinkyCon. Um, I'd like to share with you a few interesting programming things from the development of Patrick's Parabox. Uh, this is a lightning talk. It'll be very quick. So let's uh, jump right in. Uh, a quick refresher. Parabox is a Sokoban game with the twist that boxes contain other boxes. And you can push them into and out of each other, nesting them in whatever configuration you want to. And also, uh, some boxes can contain themselves directly. And the Sokoban logic, so for example, I can keep exiting here as many times as I want to. But the entering and exiting logic stays the same. The data structure under the hood here is instead of having one two-dimensional array, we're going to have one two-dimensional array for every box in the game. So I can enter push boxes into, and they will end up shifting between the arrays. And so basically, we have a 2D array of pointers to 2D arrays. Um, and the Sokoban logic is not too complicated to imagine here. Like These spots link up to each other. Um, and likewise, for these recursive levels, it's the same data structure, except that this number one here kind of refers to itself. But the Sokoban logic of these spots at the edges and adjacents linking up to each other is uh, the same here. OK, so that's our data structure under the hood. But how would we render a scene like this kind of as displayed? Well. What I came up with is let's render everything in screen coordinates. So starting with this black rectangle as our screen, let's compute this green square where we're going to draw. Everything is going to be drawn in reference to this green square in screen coordinates. This is our ultimate frame of reference. It's our ultimate anchor. I have a function draw block, which draws a specific block and all its children at any given rectangle, like so. And then when we get down to a child that has other blocks, well, we can compute that rectangle and then call draw block again, just on a smaller rectangle. And that will eventually call draw block again at a smaller rectangle, so on and so forth. And we stop until we reach size of one or two pixels. Um, OK, but how would you render? That's, that's all good. But how would you render all this stuff outside, these kind of like big objects over here? Well. Let's start all over. And now let's pretend the screen is this really small area. Instead of rendering it this green square like normal, first, we're going to move the square out to the parent level, compute where that square would be in the parent. And this is a rectangle that's much bigger than our screen can hold. And in fact, we're going to do this three times, uh, going out to the parent of the parent. So it's a really big rectangle. And as we draw this to the screen, most of this doesn't end up on the screen. But eventually, it will recurse back down to our starting square. And this will recurse back down, and everything will work out. And that's how we get these nice uh, big objects. I'll show you another level here. Uh, here's another recursive level with a block that contains itself. And as I push it, I can push this into the green box. But notice, as I push it in, we see it kind of shrink down in this nice animation. But also observe the edges of the screen here. We see this the same kind of squishing happening of the world outside of us. And it's like really trippy. Uh, so how do we do that? Well, let's walk through the same algorithm. We, again, it, as long as we keep everything relative to this anchor point, we'll see that everything will kind of work out as long as, because all the blocks are relatively positioned. So first we draw a block here. Uh, then this will recursively call draw block here on the green block. And then normally we would draw the blue block here at its real position, except all we're going to do is shift it down and shrink it or to grow it out. So it's a translation and scale offset and then call draw block there. And then this, this recurses inwards, and it works out fine. And then likewise, for our initial step of going out to three parents, 
as long as we follow those same shifting down and growing offsets at all times, this will actually just work out. It works out because as explained before, every block is positioned relative to its parent. And there's only one absolute coordinate, the green square. And as long as everything's relative to that, uh, it works out. Uh, we do have to do some a little bit of depth sorting to make sure the shrinking blue block is always drawn on top of the red blocks. Uh, just have to do a little bit of depth sorting there. Uh, a little quote from Marcus Marcos D, another Sokoban developer, Marcos Donatwani. Uh, relative coordinates equals absolute bliss. Uh, yeah. Um, one interesting consequence of this is so if you, if you look outside of the screen here, we can see these really big objects with these crisp lines, uh, which is so you might think that we render this with vector graphics, but actually we render this just with kind of big PNGs um, that end up being just big enough that you don't notice the blurriness. Good enough. Uh, and also, I see uh, Don asked in the chat here, uh, Dom, um, why do we go out three parents instead of just one or so? Well, if we went out just one parent, um, we would we would draw this green big green box, and then we would draw the blue box and then everything inside. But we wouldn't get this stuff at the bottom here because this is actually two layers out, this, this dark, dark red down here of the player. So if we go two layers out, that would cover it. And three is not a magic number. Three is just the number of levels out that ends up covering most common situations that you see in the game. Um, good enough. Uh, and here's some code in case you want to look back at the video, just some pseudo code of what I just explained. Um, OK, so that is the core rendering that I wanted to show off. Uh, now let's talk about a few edge cases. Uh, there are some levels in the game which have a block that contains itself multiple times, which is pretty cool. Uh, this is relatively straightforward. The one block just contains multiple versions of itself. And our rendering algorithm with the green squares and draw block just works. However, what I want to talk about here is this animation. So first, whenever I, when I program this, a player object would appear at all of the three copies. It would just instantly appear and then shrink down. This looked bad. And so what I did is we have to I cut it off using what's commonly called in a graphics API as like a scissor mode. So I, we scissor it to this square. And so all the children now need to be clamped into the square. Additionally, it, this still kind of looked weird to have this really big rectangle shrink down to the center. So I special cased it to let's just not scale it. Let's just do a, a positional aspect that still gets clamped. And so now it looks something like this, which ends up looking pretty natural and is not too eye-catching. But you still get this nice recursive effect of seeing everything you know, responding to your input. Uh, this is what it looked, a screenshot from development where clamping did not exist. And so things just kept getting a little bit smaller. Uh, fun, lots and lots of edge cases and bugs during the development here. Uh, another edge case is what if we had a block that contained itself but horizontally flipped? So if I exit from the left, I'll end up from the right. And if I exit from the right, I'll end up on the left. Uh, this is relatively straightforward in the Sokoban logic realm. You just swap the positions logically of where you end up, like so. But rendering, it's a, oops, I changed my colors here. Rendering is a little bit trickier. Uh, well, actually, it, but not too tricky. So in our draw block function, we just sort of add a parameter that's true or false, whether we should draw the block and its children horizontally flipped or not. But what I want to share with you is this was actually kind of a nightmare to program in reality. This is sort of code snippets from throughout the code base of multiplying by negative one and flipping the, the flag. Uh, this was really hard. Um, I, I just wanted to share my, my pain with you 
about this. <laughs> it's unexpectedly hard. Uh, I, I initially wanted to do 90 degree rotation as well as horizontal flipping, but there ended up horizontal flipping was more than enough difficulty. So I didn't do this. Uh, in contrast, so here's another mechanic where the player itself can contain other blocks. This was relatively more straightforward to implement. All we do is, I, what I did is refactor the player to be the same object as the block, just with a Boolean of, is it the player or not? And the, the Sokoban logic and the rendering logic both just kind of worked with this. Just, just in contrast to the kind of lines of code from uh, previous here. I implemented this very early on in uh, development. Uh, OK, that's all the edge cases. Uh, lastly, I wanted to touch a little bit on level editor tooling. Uh, this is not strictly uh, programming, but I did uh, program these tools, so it's sort of uh, related. Um, so here's uh, this level, which we saw earlier. <clears throat> Should have ran this before. OK. I can create new blocks. I can edit their children. I can put them, for example, inside another block like this and take it out uh, like so. I can quickly uh, have a hotkey to reload the game and play the level. This was invaluable to very quickly iterate on puzzles. Uh, I can also have a horizontal flip key which flips the object and all its children, and a vertical flip key, very convenient. Uh, and you can see that this referential block is just represented by an R. So it's just like a pointer, um, like we saw in this uh, view. I also have a hotkey to look at this uh, level in the hub, which is very convenient. And here, here we are, and I can jump into levels on my whim very quickly. And I can also very quickly oops, uh, shift ordering of levels. So for example, I can move this one here, change the arrows, very quick to have these hotkeys to very quickly iterate on all this stuff. Uh, very convenient. Uh, here, I just messed up my difficulty curve, but that's OK. Oh, I also wanted to demonstrate um, we have a hotkey to as we're we have a hotkey to increase and decrease the size of the blocks like this. Um, okay, Whew. we made it. Congratulations to me and everyone else for making it through this whirlwind of a talk. <laughs> I hope you found something in here interesting. Uh, here's my contact information. Uh, thank you thank so much, Patrick. Thank you. Um, I think you broke everybody's brains. Um, <laughs> I think you saw you were looking at the chat, so you saw all that. Um, there was one question that came up um, that was also connected to a question I was thinking about. Maybe we can just do that quickly um, before moving on to the next talk. Uh, so the question was um, from uh, Scrapolis in chat. Did anyone else help with the code? Uh, and actually, that's connected to what I was wondering about is because you did a switch port, right? Did, did somebody have to help get this, like, uh, performant for Switch. Um, yeah, the porting studio Plastic Fern uh, did a great job with the console ports of the game. Mm -hmm. um, it ended up, there ended up being some performance optimizations, but for the most part, no huge changes. Okay. I'm not an expert on optimization. Um, but otherwise, the code was all your own in the base game. In the base game, yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, there we go. All right. So thank you so much, Patrick. Uh, we'll leave it there. If there's any other questions that came up, please head over to the Discord and ask there. I haven't set up a, I forgot to set up a thread. <laughs> we'll set that up in a moment, uh, but we'll move over to the next talk. So yeah, thank you once again, Patrick, and we'll get set up for the next one. Thanks.